Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the True Life Podcast. Hope everybody's having a beautiful day. Hope the sun is shining. Hope the birds are singing. I hope the wind is at your back for you today to piggyback on some of the interesting people I've been talking about. And I, it's a topic that if you grew up the way I grew up or you're interested in altered states of consciousness or seeing the world a little bit different, I think you're going to love this show. We have, we have the incredible William Zorn. And for all the cannabis enthusiasts and marketing mavens out there today, William Zorn is an expert in all things digital marketing and a wizard in the cannabis industry. He weaves a narrative that where brands aren't just logos, they're an experience, a feeling that lingers within every thought of your favorite cannabis store. With a background steeped in management, copywriting, affiliate marketing, and event planning, he's the maestro organizer orchestrating the symphony of turning good brands into something downright extraordinary. William Zorn, I'm stoked you're here today, my friend. Maybe you can give a little bit more of a backstory than I gave there. Maybe you can flesh, that, flesh it out for people, man. Like who you are, what you got going on, and, and the way you see the world. And Yeah, you know, well, thank thank you, George, for, uh, for that lovely intro. That was beautiful. <laughs> uh, quite a wordsmith. Uh, yeah, no, uh, my name is William. Uh, I go... At, by hippie online uh, that comes back from my old uh, old days. I started out in cannabis uh, before it was an industry that you were allowed to do so. I started in Legacy Market uh, back in my hometown of Ottawa. Shout out the six one three one time. Uh, you know, I was opening stores and, and working in these legacy dispensaries, uh, afraid that the cops were going to go ahead and kick in my door uh, every single day. And somehow uh, this this beautifully transitioned into a legal job that I can go ahead and put on my resume and put it on LinkedIn, which is where I met the lovely George. Uh, yeah, I, I work uh, for Greenhouse Agency. We are Canada's top uh, digital marketing and in-person marketing, uh, specifically for cannabis. It is a company with everyone who works with me. Their background uh, is relatively similar to my own. Uh, people who, who really love the plant and want to elevate it a little bit further. And then, uh, you know, I'm also over on Twitch uh, where we kind of get a little bit less serious with it. And we talk about cannabis uh, in the way that most people talk about cannabis, which is nice and stoned. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I, I, on some level, it, you seem like such a bridge to me. You know, you, it seems to me that you're bridging the gap between this, this new world that's emerging about cannabis and the way in which it can be a plant medicine in which it can help us achieve a higher state of consciousness and see the world differently. And this other branch, it's like gaming and, and using it in a way that is more than medical. It's more like it's more than medical and beyond recreational. It's like, it's just this new way it's emerging. It's sort of a lifestyle in a way. And it's, it's without shame and without stigma. And for so many of us, for so long, it's had this stigma about it, whether it was Chi Chong or these guys are stoners, man, or, you know, people that use that are usually burnouts or something like that. But that's so not true. You know, so many people use cannabis that are highly effective and highly creative and what do you think about this relationship that has been changing with cannabis? How do you navigate those waters? It's tough. It's tough, uh, right? Like you can yeah. you can only change your own perception. You can't change yep. other people's. Like I, you know, similar background back in high school, I was known as a stoner. I didn't even smoke <laughs> weed back then. I didn't really start smoking weed till university. I was dating a grower's <laughs> daughter. So naturally, uh, that was something that became in my wheelhouse. But, you know, I was known as this, uh, as a stoner back in the day. I had people coming up to like try to get weed from me all the time. And I was like, man, I just have like long hair. I just, I looked like a burnout and I will absolutely uh, wear that title proudly. But, you know, the one thing I learned from working in the legacy market, uh, I worked in, I worked for Weeds, Glass and Gifts primarily, uh, and they were medical. They operated in that right. beautiful gray zone where uh, it was the Supreme Court of Canada said medical cannabis patients have the right to access their medicine in a physical location. It shouldn't just be through the mail. Uh, and then we kind of took that and we ran with it and we're like, Oh, you have a pill bottle. Yeah, no, absolutely. Like, come on in here. We'll, we'll allow that. Um, but the one thing I learned is that like everyone smokes weed. Uh, I used to, in my old store, the one that I opened back in Ottawa, I had a first responders discount. That was my mm -hmm. cheeky way to try to like yeah. get the cops to like me. But I had paramedics and nurses, uh, actual police officers coming in and buying cannabis from me. I was selling to people from the Ministry of Defense. 
even. Uh, like all these highly active people, and I, I saw the way in which people used cannabis. And yeah, some people used it in more yeah. of like what we would acknowledge as a medical context, like uh, like, hey, I have like really bad pain. I have arthritis. Uh, I don't want to be using benzos and opioids. I want to use something a little bit more natural. Uh, so I saw that. But then what I saw with everyone else, it, and you know, we talked about like more than recreational yeah. uh, uh, and not quite medical. I, I think that all cannabis can be broken down as medical use like if you really really think about it especially given like what health canada says so like some of the things that i deal with daily are uh, health canada's um health canada's rules about marketing and they say well you can't promise this you can't promise that you can't promise you know better sleep like a lot of people just use weed to sleep yeah which yeah. is like the cool boring way to do it right like that's how everyone's mom does it like they smoke a joint and then yeah. they go to bed and like that's medical if you have a, if you use it to just unwind after a long day in the way that I do, well, some could say like that is dealing with anxiety and then that is a medical use too. So like we're now that cannabis is legal and like everyone has seen that like, okay, society hasn't collapsed, you know, uh, there's no, there was a slight increase in traffic fatalities uh, or in traffic accidents in regards to that. But I would also argue we finally started measuring for it we yeah. find, because it's legal and we kind of know what we're looking for. You know, like we saw society didn't collapse, like everyone used it because everyone smoked weed before. Everyone smoked weed. I remember my teachers in high school smoked weed. Shout out to Miss S. I won't say your full name. Um, <laughs> but she used to come in and, and do potlucks for us. We would watch movies in anthropology class. And she would be there with like a George Foreman grill and a flat top stove and make us burgers with the reddest eyes I have ever seen. You know, like every, everyone smokes cannabis. And, uh, you know, there, there's something to be said about responsible use. Uh, and the way that we do it, but then a lot of people can smoke responsibly all the time. I, I'm, I'm a single guy. I go on, I go on dates now, and I have to explain that I get quite often when they learn what I do. They're like, "Are you high right now?" And I have to be like, <laughs> "Like a little," but I'm like <laughs> always baseline a little high. <sighs> so I think this speaks to the idea of behavior and linguistics which is something that happens in the world of marketing. And it definitely the way we model reality, our language, the words we use model the life we live, whether it's the inner dialogue we have, and it, it definitely changes our behavior. And so I'll get, I'm gonna get a little philosophical here. Mm -hmm. What do you think happens to the way you model reality and the linguistic use that you use when you're high like does does being high change the the relationship you have to the world and if so how everyone's a little different with it right like yeah my high, we could smoke the same thing together yep. in the same room george and, and we could have like yep. two wildly different experiences sure that's just like the way the body chemistry goes but from what i've seen uh, and anecdotal uh, examples that uh, I've come across. Yeah, it, it changes the way that we perceive it. I find, at least I, and I can only speak really for myself, sure. it, it slows me down. It makes me take a deeper look at things. Um, you know, we're, we're in the society where everything's like quick, quick, yeah. quick, you know, order, order food on your phone. It'll be there in 20 minutes. Uh, cannabis, uh, at least the relationship I have, it makes me kind of slow down, take a step back, re-examine things think about it a little bit deeper and from angles that maybe i wasn't exploring yeah. before and that can that can be attributed to a lot of things i think with cannabis a big thing is that it breaks down people's ego uh it helps you put that to the back seat you uh it, as old hippies say you know you stop being a me start being a we you're part yeah. of the whole connected to the universe uh i wouldn't go quite that far but I would say that like it, it encourages different thinking and that's why, you know, people have and will continue to use it in the way that we see it. Right. Like a, a yeah. prominent example is the Beatles. The second we gave those like four nerdy British dudes like <laughs> joints and drugs, the music changed so much because they were examining and they were seeing the world through a different light and they were, they were hearing sounds in a different way. Uh, it, it alters perception so so much at, at least for me and for everyone else that i see and you know there are the the daily stoners yeah. who smoke all day long the people who back when i was working in dispensaries were like i've been smoking since you were a twinkle in your dad's <laughs> eye maybe maybe their state isn't as altered but it changes something if it didn't change something we wouldn't do it right yeah yeah it's really well said and i i i think that 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 
state, that change in perception is what helps a lot of people in the medical field. Because a lot of times when we talk about medicine, we talk about people that are facing anxiety, people that are facing depression, maybe people that are facing eating disorders, but all of those particular all of those particular ailments can be helped out by changing the way you view yourself or changing the way you view your situation. And I think plant medicines do it, whether it's cannabis or psychedelics. I think that these particular medicines have a way of helping us see ourselves, helping us see confrontation, helping us model reality differently. And that's why I asked that question. I think it's the, the, it's it's that relationship to ourselves that the plants can help us change. And like so much of the problems we have in the world today are these ideas of perception. And and what do you think about that? Do you think that it helps us perceive ourselves and our position in the world differently? And maybe that's why it's such a medical benefit to us? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think he hit, uh, hit the nail right on the head there. Um, it, it changes the way, like, I, I really like the example that you just gave of, you know, people with eating disorders. That yeah. was something that I saw regularly when I was working, uh, in medical dispensaries as well as recreational dispensaries, because I'm going to be so honest with you. That's, yeah, that's the it. need that recreational dispensaries fill right now. People who are going there are shopping medically. They just mm. need to alter their verbiage. So the, yeah. the, 20 year old bud tender like doesn't get in trouble and doesn't have you know health canada or uh, my governing body here would be uh, agco doesn't have them breathing down their neck um you know like with people with uh with eating disorders especially not only does cannabis go ahead and like stimulate appetite in a lot of way i find it changes people's relationship with food yeah, while they might it. have this uh co very combative relationship with food before consuming cannabis afterwards they view it as full as fuel for them they view it as something yeah. that they need they view it as something to be enjoyed rather than to be something feared and you know maybe when that high wears off they go back to that other state of feeling about it and the other way that they perceive uh their relationship with food but i find for a lot of people it, it helps them keep that mentality moving forward at least a little bit right you can yeah. you can only grow incrementally so, um, yeah, it's, it changes perception. It changes our relationship. You know, um, it, it makes people more empathetic. I think that's something that I really see with cannabis. Like yeah. I, I have a ton of friends. I went to, I have a liberal arts degree. So politics and philosophies are something that I was very used to speaking about. And, you know, I, you'd speak with these people when they're stone cold sober and their convictions are their convictions. They're like, this, this is it. No, 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 you're, you're wrong. You're an idiot. If you don't see it the way I do. And then you like smoke a joint together and they're like, yeah, you know what? Like I can get how you're coming from that angle. Cause you know, you don't think you're the bad guy in this. I don't think I'm the bad guy. Yeah. In this. We have our perceptions and reality often lies somewhere in the middle. Yeah. I love that. You know, and when you look back at, some of the indigenous ways when they would pass around a peace pipe, like there's an offering, there's a sacrifice that's made. And sometimes that sacrifice is putting your preconceived notions up here for a minute. Okay. I do have really strong feelings about that, but I'm going to set those aside for a minute and actually listen to what you have to say. Cause maybe in this moment we can begin to influence one another. And I, I really think that there's something to be said about, solving problems through a ceremonial setting. And often that comes with a plant medicine or, or at least the ability for people to set aside their preconceived notions, right? The purpose of an argument is not to win, it's to solve a problem. And it sounds to me that a lot of that can be done when we have this offering in front of us, whether it's a, whether it's a joint, whether it is maybe mushrooms or whether it is just a ceremonial setting. I, I really think that this is one way we can set the stigma aside. Like plant medicines, be it cannabis or mushrooms or psychedelics, they still carry this giant stigma, Will. Like what can we do about that, man? What do you think? It's honest conversation and exposure, I think, right? Okay. Like my my father, God love the man, uh, he <laughs> hated plant medicine to start with like i remember right. i was uh i was 16 years old i had a half gram of weed i had just smoked for the first time i, I felt amazing i got home i hid it in my little bedside counter i then spent an hour making sure nothing smelt like weed <laughs> for breeze everywhere open windows i heard the as i laid down on my uh, on my bed to enjoy the high finally i heard the garage door open 
And I looked at the time and I was like, he's not supposed to be there. And he came up and he's like, where is it? And I didn't even debate. I was like, yeah, all right, here you go. Yeah, here it is, man. Yeah. Uh, and you know, he's like, I'm, I'm going to call the cops. You're a burnout. You're a dumbass. Uh, this and that and this and that. And, uh, you know, to get a little personal, you know, I, as a teenager, I really struggled with my mental health. I had, uh, yeah. I had a lot of shit going on, man. And, uh, I was on SSRIs. I was on, and this isn't me bashing conventional medicine sure. for anyone listening there. Conventional medicine works for some, but for some people it doesn't. And for me, it just didn't work and it made the problem so much worse. So over time I ended up, uh, myself seeking out a medical cannabis prescription and, and starting to use plant medicine rather than traditional forms of medicine. Mm -hmm. And I got better. I, I got a lot better. And I remember I was on the phone with my dad one day and he's like, wow, you know, like you, you sound so different. You know, you're not in crises anymore. Uh, you're, you're doing really well. What is it? And I was like, well, I stopped taking my meds and he freaked the fuck out. And he's like, oh my God, are you okay? You shouldn't do that. And I was like, well, no, like I'm using cannabis instead. Yeah. And he was like, oh, really? And he saw that you know, I was in university. My grades had gotten better since I started smoking dope, uh, as he would put it. Smoking dope is such like an old school term, but <laughs> totally. I love it still. Me too. Uh, but he saw like my grades went up. My financial situation got better. I was having better relationships at work. My relationship with my family got a lot better. Uh, my relationship with myself got got relatively fixed there as much as it yeah. ever can be with one person. So like exposing people to those stories like that and being like, hey, man, it's not just like Cheech and Chong. We're not just like, you know, pulling out like the giant <laughs> joint <laughs> up on Parliament Hill <laughs> screaming to legalize it. Like, no, like we're using it as part of a healthy and uh, and fulfilling lifestyle and a productive lifestyle. And people see that more and more. And the longer, you know, I, I'm blessed. I'm, I'm over here in Canada. It's federally legal now. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I see that attitude shifting. You know, I see people come into pot stores that uh, would have never felt comfortable doing so back in the day. I mean, like I was part of the first three stores that opened in my city because uh, there was a lottery system to get a license, which is ridiculous. So there was three pot stores in a uh, in a city of over a million people. Um, so I got to see a lot of the city's uh, residents and, you know, the people who weren't comfortable with it before, like they really opened up because now this legal stigma is gone. They don't need to worry about losing their job, losing their home, not being able to get a bank loan, whatever it is. Um, you know, they're able to enjoy it and experience it. And I think that once people have that experience with cannabis themselves and they see like, oh, it's not reefer madness. I didn't like see the devil and <laughs> want to go madness. stab someone, uh, you know, like they they have a better perception and then pair this with people like myself who have uh, who have these stories of medical use. Uh, and it being really effective and it helping them to live happy, productive lives, that stigma starts to disappear really, really quickly. Yeah, that's well said. I appreciate that story. It's, I, I think it is the vulnerability and the courage to tell the story about, look, I use this and it helps me. And I, I don't, I know people are going to be offended by that and I'm sorry, but let me tell you my story and then you guys can be the judge of it because so many people have been affected by it. And, you know, I, I love storytelling and I love the stories we tell ourselves and I love the people that are confident enough to share their vulnerability and their stories because I do think that helps destigmatize things. For a long period of time, the stories we told about it seem to be coupled with burnout. And, then, you know, it, it's it's these basically propaganda, whether it's reefer madness or it is, you know, the the five o'clock news where they put this giant bag of weed and then they show these guns and then they show these people's ruined lives. They get people to equate ruined lives with this plant, you know, but it's, it's not true. I'm not saying there's not elements of truth to it. Like sometimes you can find people that have gone down the wrong path and they happen to be partnered with, with psychedelics or they be partnered with with weed in some ways, but it doesn't mean that that's what led them to that path. And I do think it comes back to storytelling and the stories we tell ourselves are the stories that shape our world. And as you and I were talking, as we started the show, it's amazing to see the relationship with, with these different plants. It's changing. You know, when we spoke about in the beginning of the show, it used to be, you would buy a bag of Maui Wowie from your uncle's friend who had a, you know, a little hideout somewhere. 
But now we have these Terp profiles and we have personalized medicine and we have stories of people who have gotten better and gotten off hard drugs by using cannabis like that. What do you think about this maturing relationship that we have going on and, and the way that's performing? And what what maybe you could speculate into the future if we continue to see this relationship change in a positive, mature way, what can we look forward in the future? Um, yeah, I you know, I think yeah, exactly as you said, uh storytelling is yeah. huge with it because at the you know, everyone wants want stats and, and yeah. uh, you know like solid figures and numbers but i think that like once you hear these anecdotal examples you know uh, i was just quickly typing to to get the name so i didn't fuck it up but like the story of uh, charlotte figgy you know the, mm. the child with epilepsy who nothing was working and these this family was so scared that they were going to lose their daughter that they were like okay you know what like sure we'll try weed we'll try whatever it is yeah and, and now we have like this beautiful medicine uh, you know, cannabis, cannabis is growing and evolving exactly as you said, you know, it used to be, do you want a bag of weed? Yeah. D what is it? It's weed, man. <laughs> do, do you want it? And now, you know, consumers, at least where, where I'm at in the areas where uh, it's becoming more acceptable, maybe that's legally, maybe that's, you know, public perception, maybe it's both. Um, you know, cannabis is changing the way that people shop for cannabis yeah. is changing. You know, uh, we've seen, you know, back in the day, uh, legacy market cultivars were, were the biggest thing. Like, what yeah. is it? Charlotte's Web? Is it Maui Waui? As he said, you know, what are, what are we looking for here? But now now that it's legal, we're able to take a look behind it and we're like, oh, you know, a cultivar of its same seed or same clone, if, if it's in two different environments, it's going to grow differently. It's going to yeah. produce a different terpene profile, different minor and major cannabinoids. Uh, and, and you get into the nitty gritty of what is happening with it. Like I, you know, we're talking about what to look forward for the future. This is something to look forward to, but like also not for me. Like I always, I always tell people now, I'm like, weed isn't cool anymore, man. <laughs> like it's not, you know, weed content back in the day was like, some dude that you look like he was in like he was your friend's older brother you know that lived in the basement <laughs> and he's like smoking like two grams of shatter to the face and now it's almost like wine mom content yeah. like that's what i've seen like that's the biggest change that has has come from it and i think that the more knowledge we get the more boring and normalized cannabis is going to be and like that's okay like we don't need to to really hold on to certain elements of cannabis right. culture. What we do need to do is make this something that's easily digestible for everybody. So everybody can derive the benefits or at least see where the benefits are. You yeah. know what I mean? Weed isn't for everybody. I, I will, I will fight tooth and nail. I'm not one of those stoners who's like, Oh man, you just haven't tried the right strain yet, dude. My <laughs> uncle grows some gas. It's going to work for you, dude. No, like that's, that's an immature and, and a childish way to look at it. You know, one medicine isn't for everybody. If it was, we'd have this beautiful elixir that would heal everything, mm -hmm. but we don't. Everyone's body is different. The way that we interact with medicines, whether it's traditional pharmacopoeia or whether it is, uh plant medicines you know it, it's a very individualized personalized thing so the the larger the longer we go into cannabis being in the mainstream the more boring and normalized it's going to be but that's what we need to fight the stigma yeah i like that it it's it's growing up in a way where you get past this rebellious stage and then you know you sort of become part of the solution instead of being part of the problem and i, I see it growing up in that way it's it's interesting to think about. But this kind of leads us into this, this idea of branding. We, we talked about stigma a little bit, and now we've talked about storytelling. And I think those two things sort of come together for a brand, you know, like how, how do we continue to keep this, this relationship going? Like, is there a place where it can flow into, can it, can it, can cannabis permeate markets where it's acceptable like gaming on some level like obviously there's there's already codes for game like you have to have a mature label but you know you've got some interesting thoughts here maybe you can flesh that out for us a little bit yeah um no the story storytelling is is huge with any brand right. and if you're if you're like me and you're in canada you're kind of kneecapped a little bit health canada's sure. rules are extremely extremely uh, restrictive on what you can and what you can't say and, and how you can build a brand, you know, like packaging, for instance, packaging right. is a huge part of a brand. Uh, and right now cannabis is treated a little bit more like cigarettes and a little okay. bit less like alcohol. 
Um, but you know, people, people are still fighting the good fight and we're, we're working to do that. But, you know, I, I do work with people, uh, in America and, and see the American markets and there are brands that are emerging and becoming winners and storytellers from it. There are these amazing marketing campaigns. Like, uh, I can't remember the name for the life of me, but sure. Jay-Z's cannabis brand did a really beautiful, uh, marketing campaign. Uh, and they, of course, you know, being Jay-Z's label, they kind of lean into hip hop sure. and a little bit of the renegade rebellious side of things. But then they were also using that brand image to point out the inconsistencies in uh, in the laws that existed. So right along borders of states that were approved for cannabis and not approved for cannabis, they would have these billboards that would essentially say like, hey, weed over here is like a five year sentence, but weed over here. You can go get it at like Dave's Dave's pot shop. Yeah. Uh, for instance, you know, uh, brands brands are going to grow, but I think a challenge that uh, Canadian brands find is that they feel very restricted by the marketing uh, rules and regulations that exist right now, and they don't try to look outside of it. They're they're just looking at dead on. They're like, right. okay, well, we can't do this, and everyone's trying to make a brand for everybody. That's not what brands are, right? Like brands, a brand shouldn't be for everybody. You, a brand, mm. a satisfying cannabis brand should not be selling to the 90 year old grandma who wants to use it to go to bed at night and me, <laughs> you right, know what right. I mean? Like different markets. Exactly. Uh, and, and everyone's trying to do that, but we're seeing specialization come in. You know, I'm working with brands right now who, who have these beautiful stories and ideas. Mm -hmm. So like, uh, for instance, I'm working with a, a brand called Guyanica right cool. now, and they're addressing something in the market that uh, is, is a big problem. It's that like every edible right now is, you know, high fructose corn syrup, gummies, Everyone likes their gummies here and there's like all these different gummy brands and they're all the same except for like one called Sensor Edibles that is shaped like dicks and butts and boobs. <laughs> That's like the most unique one there. <sighs> so Guyanica came in and they were like, well, like not everyone wants to eat gummies. Like there are more health conscious people. Mm -hmm. There are people who, you know, like they care about not just the cannabinoids that they're putting in the yeah. body, but what goes with it. So they've worked to make these... Uh, they're almost like granola bars or like these natural fruit bars. Uh, you know, they do have sugar in them, but it's the natural sugar from the ingredients rather than something ed added in. So now they're hitting this market of people who are holistic and people who are a little bit more of a conscious yeah. consumer versus everyone who is like, oh, yeah, you just we need to find a creative way to put 10 milligrams in a bag. Uh, let's let's make the gummies shaped like some wieners. Right. Uh, which hey great and i love those right. products censored edibles i love you guys uh no no hate no shade there but i'm just saying that like you know it, becoming an interesting brand and like setting yourself aside isn't something that we're seeing right now um but as uh, as marketing regulations lift up and as the the space gets more and more crowded we're gonna see people make these plays and start to look outside of uh you know outside of the norm i love it Let's dig, let's dig into some behavior, Will. Like, here, here's here's an idea that like I was thinking about, and tell me if this is happening in your neck of the woods. And if it's not, people listening, you should get on this. You talk to Will and make this happen. But when I think of branding, I think of strategic partnerships. You know, in in might there be some really creative ways for cannabis companies out there to start making some strategic partnerships with different artists. You know, I know that maybe that bridge might be tenuous to cross, but, you know, the same way that like Grey Goose sponsors Kid Rock's tour. I don't know if that's true, but like, you, you know, you, there are certain companies that sponsor artists or that have a strategic partnership with them. Are you seeing anything on that strategic partnership front? Like, it seems like artists and different companies would go hand in glove. Very rarely. So right now there is a, as I said, those those regulations really okay. really bite us That's, all in the ass okay. when it comes to marketing. And uh, you're not allowed legally. You're not allowed to have celebrity endorsements. Ah, That's the thing. okay, okay. But here's how here's how some brands are getting okay. away with it. They're making the celebrity the owner. Um, ah. one one example which like I shouldn't really give as an example because it fumbled <laughs> so okay. hard. We can learn industry. from it. We can learn but, from it. Yeah, Seth Rogen had a brand here in okay. Canada. He partnered. Uh, he partnered with Canopy, uh, and so did Snoop Dogg, and they both had their nice. own brands 
that uh, that released here. And because they were part owners, they were able to speak to that involvement. It, you see. couldn't say, oh, Seth Rogen loves this weed and he sponsors this weed. But you could say, yeah, Seth Rogen owns the company. Or mm -hmm. he's, he's part of it. Uh, same with Snoop Dogg. Snoop Dogg, you know, Seth Rogen didn't learn from his fumble. He just operates in the States. No, no shade, Seth Rogen. Uh, yeah. Pineapple Express was a goaded movie. Um, <laughs> But, you know, he he left the Canadian market and he was like, oh, but like Snoop Dogg just came back with it. And he has uh, he has a new brand that the branding is super interesting. And it's one of those things where like, yeah, can you say like this is Snoop Dogg's brand? Not not really given the marketing thing, but mm -hmm. all of the imagery is like so congruent with it. And as as when it comes to working with artists, like we are starting to see uh, some brands take risks. Right. I think that there is something to be said about a little bit of civil disobedience. Like I always remind people, I'm like, yeah. hey guys, we didn't get weed legal by just waiting until the government said that we could do it, right? Right. It took a lot of arrests and people making points and, and demonstrating to get us to where we are today. So a little bit of civil disobedience is a little, like it's okay. It, we should be doing it. You're gonna get slapped on the wrist yeah. with uh, with some stuff, but like whatever, man. Like that's that's rock and roll. That's weed, baby. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I see a really prominent brand, Ghost Drops. Uh, Ghost Drops uh, comes from Legacy to Legal Market. Okay, uh, they're owned by uh, the gentleman who founded King of the Dot, which is uh, a really big uh, hip hop battle rap community. Uh, it's owned by him, Organic. And, uh, you know, he's a part of it and everyone knows that and people who like love the organic name go there. But like because of this legacy connection that they still have, like they're cool to smoke. And we're seeing yeah. uh, we're seeing them post artists that are holding their stuff. You know, um, I worked with actually I don't think I can say their name, um, but I worked with I worked with a company and they that's what their focus was. They were trying to put cannabis into the hands of. Uh, of influential people so like i saw like the baby smoking uh, a legal cannabis brand from canada and i was like oh okay sure yeah, yeah. that's that's cool <laughs> you know so people are, people are doing it and while there might be these rules and regulations uh when it comes to cannabis and cannabis people we're really great at finding the gray zone in those rules and, and using them to our advantage so yeah we're seeing you know brands tied uh, to certain celebrities like we have uh viola which is uh anthony De i'm not a sports guy right, but he, he was right. a big he was a big sports guy you know but he has his brand snoop has his brand seth had his brand and you know i think uh the longer that we go in the market and the more viable that cannabis becomes uh as as an industry and as something that can make money rather than lose it mm -hmm. um we're gonna see more partnerships and, and celebrity brands coming to market in the same way that it happens with alcohol yeah, it's interesting. And, you know, it's also very. What's the word I'm looking for? There's a ton of opportunity when something is new because you can begin to create the future of the, it's like the future of what you will be thought as, you know, like the we, we sometimes you look at alcohol as like a it's always billed as like, hey, it's a good time. You know, you're going to have a good time. Look at this party. Or, you know, sometimes cigarettes can be looked at as like someone's going outside and smoking and they're contemplating. And, you know, a lot of writers use it and stuff like this. You know, with the medical container in Canada, can the sponsorships, could, could there be cannabis companies that sponsored like a jujitsu tournament? Like what are the rules there for as far as sponsoring something? Is that I mean, you're not really saying like, hey, we're, we're doing this thing. Is that a no-no in the medical world in Canada, like sponsoring something like that? They they can and they do sponsor some events. But okay. the biggest thing is uh, is the rule is that like that cannot be open. It needs to be in an age-gated environment. If cannabis is going to be operating somewhere, it needs to be in an age-gated environment, which, hey, good rule. But at the same time, like maybe we should like apply this across the board for <laughs> – yeah, cigarettes, yeah. alcohol, you know what I mean? Right, like there are right. all these like all ages shows and they're sponsored by Bacardi and you're like, oh, okay. <laughs> like why can't like Joe Blow's pot like be a part right. of this too? Like we right. are seeing uh, cannabis go in this direction. You know, companies are are working alongside, you know, events and venues to to contribute there. 
but unfortunately the thing that scares a lot of uh, a lot of these partnerships away is that that need to be age gated and like once once cannabis is tied to it like all those communications need to be relatively age gated what does that mean age gated so it, it just needs to be in an environment that uh, a minor would not see it. You know, there oh. are all these rules about like what, what you can and can't do. But the biggest thing and uh, one of the they they identified like when they legalized cannabis, they identified like the three goals of it. And one was like to combat the legacy market and one was to get it out of the hands of kids. It mm. was it was like we can all agree adults should be able to smoke pot. Kids shouldn't. They, they. I'm sorry. If your brain isn't developed, like don't smoke weed unless you're doing it with a doctor and, and it's yeah. very carefully monitored. So, so these age gates, uh, you know, the way that we most often see them would be on websites of that classic. Hey, put in your age here before you come mm. in and you take a look at what's happening. Age gate. Okay. Uh, and then you know, for for the physical venues, it's as much as having like a bouncer at the front door. Like a lot of dispensaries here have someone who is working at the front door and they are checking IDs as people come in uh, and making sure that they can exist there. You know, I I worked in a period where you would check IDs for everyone. Like me and you, like we don't exactly look like we're 16 anymore. Uh, you're you're aging better than I am, but like we don't exactly look like we're 16 anymore. Um, but like they would still check our IDs. Yeah. And if we didn't have them, too bad. Like too bad, so sad. You're not getting in. Yeah. Uh, and these rules have like lightened up a little bit. People are like, okay, if grandma's trying to go to the pot shop, she doesn't <laughs> need her ID. But like you know, we're we're making sure that kids can't get access to it, and that goes into uh, events too. You know, if you're if you as a cannabis company are sponsoring an event here in Canada, you need to make sure that there is an age gate at it. So you can do these 19 plus venues and events. You can shit with nightclubs, concerts mm -hmm. that are going to be age gated regardless. You can go ahead and do that. It, it's still like there are some risks. And, you know, before I yeah. would give a client any any sort of green light to go ahead, I would examine, you know, the event. I would bring up the cannabis act which is like bookmarked on my computer <laughs> and i would read through it again just in case because the stoners don't always have the best memories right. for the rules and regulations uh but no like we're, we're seeing it happening more and more and uh and hopefully through these it will get normalized and eventually loosen up it's interesting i didn't i, I was unaware of all that and i gotta think on some level that it's competing with alcohol and cigarettes and so that there would be an active campaign to try to keep that in its container as much as possible. Is that, is that accurate? You know, I, I can't speak steadily sure. on that. I don't have all the information, so I can't give you a solid answer. What right. I will say is that a lot of, uh, alcohol and tobacco companies actually are now invested in cannabis oh, nice. uh, and they're working with it. And like, there's, there's so regularly that I'll talk to someone and we're going through our background. I'm like, what's your background? I'm like, ah, I worked at pot shops and yeah. I've always been in this weed community. And I'm like, what about you? And they're like, oh, I was, uh, I was with Marlboro for 25 years. I was with Philip Morris. Mm. Uh, you know, they're, they're invested in it, but at the same time, yeah, there's absolutely behind the scenes, some lobbying efforts to, to have this contained and like the biggest way that we're seeing it right now uh in my opinion is edibles mm -hmm. so here you are only allowed to have 10 milligrams per package wow. you can't have those hundred milligram thousand milligram shatter bars anymore uh on the legal side on the licensed side of things um so with that like you know cannabis beverages are a huge mm -hmm. emerging category but they're being kneecapped by these regulations. So, you know, there are people moving right now. There is a, a great change.org petition uh, that is trying to get the government of Canada to re-examine these rules, to have Health Canada re-examine these rules and change the limit on potency. Uh, but absolutely, that's a part of it because these alcohol, uh, alcohol primarily is what I'm going to source here. They yeah. don't want you to be able to go get a cannabis drink and be buzzed from that. They want you to go to the bar yeah. and have three or four drinks as well. You know, that's the same reason that we don't see infused beverages and foods for sale or available, um, you know, outside of a dispensary. And when they're in a dispensary, you know, it's it's 10 milligrams in the package. You know, you're not really allowed to have like a bar that, yeah, they're going to serve, you know, alcohol cocktails, but maybe they're also going to serve like a cannabis cocktail yeah. with a, a measured standard dose because like we don't really have a standard dose yet. Hmm. Yeah, that's fascinating to think about. It's, it's, it's. I, I've I've read some interesting literature too. I can't cite the source, but people can probably go online and do some 
do some of their own investigating. But it seems to me that the same way our relationship with cannabis is maturing, our relationship with alcohol on some level is is spoiling. Like I seem maybe maybe that's just the crew I hang out with or whatever. But you know, why go out and get plastered and fall down drunk and be horrible the next day? So you're just like, oh, I can't even get a bed versus like it's much cooler to sit down and have like an introspective conversation with someone, you know, and spend your time listening to some music at the same concert with the same artist, but enjoying your time in a way that's more fulfilling. I think that that is, is something that is changing on the front lines. Have you noticed that sort of behavior change? Oh yeah. Yeah. And you, you'd see it like from the ground level in the yeah. dispensaries, there were yep. so many people who came in and they were drinkers and then they transitioned away from drinking over to yeah. cannabis. You know, uh, over here we have unhoused people who regularly sit outside of LCBO. That's the one place you can buy liquor. Uh, in my province, you can't go to like a gas station or a convenience store. Well, convenience stores now you can get like some beer, maybe some wine, uh, depending if they're licensed stuff. Right. But like they, they used to wait outside the liquor stores. Now they're waiting outside the pot shops and the ones who wait outside the pot shops are a lot fucking nicer than the ones outside of the <laughs> liquor store. That's for sure. You know, you, you also see, you know, the consumers coming in, they're saying like, Hey, I'm replacing alcohol. I'm switching over from my nightcap over to something here. You know, I, I would never bash alcohol. I, I mean, humans have this long, yeah. amazing history with it, but we're also starting to become like cognizant of the issues with it. Right. Yeah. Like we're, we're starting to understand like, Oh yeah. Like when someone drinks, like they're more likely to commit some crimes than the dude who goes and smokes a joint, you know, yeah. you're more likely to die from drinking than you are smoking weed. Thousands of people die. Uh, I want to say every day. I'm going to say, I'm going to say every year just to be a little sure, bit measured smart. in my response. Uh, but you know, thousands of people die from, you know, overconsumption of alcohol or even withdrawing of alcohol. Yeah. We don't have that happening with cannabis. So, you know, people, people are learning it. And as our, our relationships with, with the substances we consume are changing and evolving, you know, I, I don't think we're yeah. ever going to stop drinking right. beer right. And, and having wine and, and liking to go to a bar. But that being said, like the more substances open up, we can now pair them and, and consume intentionally. Right before when weed was illegal, you wanted to get a little fucked up with your buddies. All right, I guess we're gonna do beer. And then you wake up the next day, you have a black eye because you got in a fist fight with someone over like what the best pizza topping was. And you're like, oh damn, <laughs> I really regret that. But now you can be like, oh cool, we're doing a like, cool kickback. Why don't we grab like some cannabis beverages instead and you know have a good time, spin some records. Um, you know, other psychedelics too are coming yeah. more and more to the forefront, like in the same way that we had um those gray market existing dispensaries for cannabis uh back in like 2017 we now have those with mushrooms where i'm mm -hmm. at down the road from me there's a mushroom store and uh i would pull out a, a bag of it and see look it comes in this beautiful package but like i totally for legal reasons i do not have that with me i only consume legal products uh purchased from legal sources of course of course um but you know what I mean? Like people are getting Dude. more access to more substances and now we're learning like what the proper pairing is. You yeah. know what I mean? You want a quiet night in? All right, smoke a joint. You want to go out and get rowdy with your fellas? Okay, go have some beers. Like go go split a pitcher. Do whatever you want to do. Um, but yeah, no, that relationship is changing. It's evolving. I think we're going to continuously see it. Um, I think we're going to see uh, in the next 10 years, alcohol sales probably decline and cannabis yeah. sales continue to go up. Yeah, it's interesting. Sometimes I like to look at our world through demographics. And, you know, there's such a large baby boomer generation. And like that particular cohort of us ran on the drugs of alcohol, even though they had this romantic fling with psychedelics probably in the 60s. And some of them, a lot of people I know that are boomers still smoke pot, smoke cannabis or weed or whatever. But it seems to me as the generations mature, so does the next generation's ideas about intoxication mature. You know, and I, I use that word because it seems to me that a lot of the, crea the, the, the creative ideas, a lot of the business, a lot of our relationships, they run on intoxicants. Like when you meet somebody new, it's intoxicating. When you have a relationship with alcohol, it's intoxicating. When you have a relationship with, with cannabis, it's intoxicating. And that which you are intoxicated by seems to be the catalyst with which you create things for you know and it's interesting to look at that relationship and what's coming out of it and when i look at the the older generation who fueled themselves on on a lot of a lot of alcohol you know it's it's mm -hmm. binge drinking and in and, and this particular type of alcoholic fuel it seems like it led us into this world of 
linear thinking. We're like, yeah, I have to get up and go to this job every day that you hate so you can make just enough money to support your family that never sees you, you know, but now with these new intoxic, these new intoxicants, you're like, you're having these epiphanies of like, wait a minute, do we have to do it this way? I don't want to do that anymore. You know, and, th and that brings to the idea of, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe that could be one reason why there's a stigma against it. Maybe there's people in positions of authority that don't want you to run on this new substance that makes you create different things. I know that that's, you know, if I put my tinfoil hat on, I can go down that road. But what do you think about the intoxicants people take and the output that comes from that? Yeah, I think that they're they're definitely tied, right? Uh, yeah. I mean, like this gener this the generation of millennials are drinking less than than any generation beforehand, right? Because yeah. we've seen the negative sides yes. of it. We've seen, you know, dad comes home from the factory and he grabs his bottle and fucking smacks you up the head. <laughs> And, uh, and we're like, oh, damn, I don't want to be a part of that. And there's also like a conscious shift more yeah. so where people are thinking about health and wellness in a different way. And, you know, well, yeah, can, consuming intoxicants and what we consume is becoming more normalized and we're getting a bit more variety too. I also say yep. that we're normalizing not consuming uh, for a lot of people. I know so many people that like just don't partake in alcohol. They don't partake in any sort of intoxicant. And like, God yeah. love them, man. Yeah. You know, like they're, they're cool people. Um, as what we're saying about like creative outputs, like tinfoil hat time, like this has been, this has been so, <laughs> we're so sure of it. Like yeah, Nixon's yeah. war on drugs. Thank you. He wanted to arrest two people, people of color and hippies. Those were the people that he hated. Why? Yeah. Because they were bringing forward these radical new wow. ideas of like, Hey, like maybe like universal, like maybe Maybe if you're mentally ill or maybe if you have like a physical ailment, like you deserve to be able to live like controversial idea. And he's like, oh, oh, I can't have that. Oh, <laughs> fucking hippies. All right. Let's, you know, let's make it let's make it all illegal. I mean, it's been proven yeah. that, you know, Nixon's war on drugs was for these nefarious purposes. That's why the term marijuana hit the the public vernacular the way that it did. It's always been tied to uh, to, to Mexican consumption. Uh, and the, the story behind the word marijuana is like so, so beautiful. It, it comes from uh, it comes from this prohibition and their uh, and religious practices being uh, needing to be hidden from from the white man. Um, and so they called it marijuana. But then Nixon, his administration, like, oh, what are they, they calling it? They're calling it marijuana. Yeah, we can we can use all the anti-Mexican sentiment of the time. <laughs> we'll call it that. And then people are going to hate potheads, too, because yeah. they're going to tie them to Mexicans. Uh, mm -hmm. now we're, we're in a place where, you know, racism is still a problem. I'm not saying we're better, but I'm saying like, we're having these conversations more about how to be less problematic and how like, Hey, uh, no matter where you're born, you're still a fucking human being mm -hmm. and you have these inherent rights, uh, and you deserve happiness and you deserve to be treated like a human being. You know, now that this is happening too, like, you know, the, the shift is happening. You know, yeah. I think the biggest shift that we've witnessed is the working from home. Like, as you said, like these nine to five jobs where you, you work, you sell your soul, you get home with barely any time to do anything. My generation is working from home more and more. Yeah. I know so many people too that even identify as digital nomads and they don't just it. work in a home office like I do. They travel, man. They're like yep. doing it from like Tulum, Mexico. They're yeah. over in Peru and they're living these like really beautiful artistic lives because like that zeitgeist of like, okay, you, you need to go to school, go to university, Get a job right out of university, marry someone you fucking hate, work the job you <laughs> fucking hate, and then you're locked in until you die. Yeah, my generation is going like, oh, I don't want that. Yeah, I don't want that at all. Like, and we're and we're choosing, and I think that the substances that we're consuming are helping change this uh, this mindset, right? Like people yeah. people of my generation are very open about shroom consumption. Yeah. About, about psilocybin consumption and i find the, the more people i know that do psilocybin they are more likely and this is just my anecdotal sure. uh, example they are more likely to have those different priorities and those different values because they've seen shit that the other people can't and they they've examined a side that other people haven't examined um so you know our, our relationship and human being relationships with with our intoxicants uh, are, are shifting they're ever-changing um, and, and, you know, as, as they shift and change, so will, uh, the thoughts and the cultures tied to them. I love it, man. 
you know, I, I'll take it one step further. I think on some level, like I do a lot of psychedelics and I've found that the way in which I interpret reality, it's almost like the earth is speaking to us through us. And it doesn't necessarily need to be psychedelics or cannabis. It could be breath work. But if you just take time to sit out in nature a little bit, it's the greatest teacher on the planet. Instead of going to Harvard, maybe you should go sit by a waterfall. Instead of going to Yale, maybe sit by a battered coastline and just watch what's happening there because you can get a real education and understanding of how the world really works. You can see the, the relentless pounding of the waves just taking apart this giant mammoth coastline. Like, wow, that's what persistence is. If I just persist at this level, I will make my way towards something. You know, and, and on some level, I, I think that the younger generation is really beginning to see the world differently than the last generation. And I, I think it's beautiful. I think it's poetic in so many ways. And, uh, you know, as a, I was a UPS driver for 26 years and I met a lot of really cool people and I learned a lot of stuff there. But I really hope that Gen X is one of the very last generations that decides to live this lifestyle where you lease your life to a company for 30 or 40 years. While I made great connections, to everybody listening to this, if you're younger than me, if you're at a job, look, you got to do what you got to do. But here's what I've learned on some level is that I watch guys work, work 30 years, retire, and then die the next year. I watch guys work 30 years, have double shoulder surgery, and then the company be like, yeah, I don't think you did that here. You know, and then they lose everything and then they get divorced. They start drinking. Their kids don't like them. And for me, I was like, oh, my God, I, this is the road I'm on. Like, I cannot. I, I, I refuse. I refuse to do this anymore. And I see people my age and older starting to come to that idea as they approach this thing called retirement, whatever the hell that is. But I see the generation younger than me going like, yeah, man, I get it. I don't want that. And I hope that people begin to to rally behind that. And I hope that cannabis, psychedelics, breath work, being a digital nomad, having courage in yourself, you know, I, I think that all these things people can see to start living a better life. I think that's what's emerging. And maybe that's why our relationship with with cannabis or psychedelics is changing, is because we've for far too long we have been trapped in this world of that just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. You know, maybe we're looking for new meaning. And I think that that's what cannabis and psychedelics do is they provide a new meaning. What say you about meaning and cannabis and relationships? I, I mean, it's tough, but yeah, to, to, that's, that's quite a bit. That's quite a bit to tackle there, but no, like as you, as you're saying, you're talking about it, you know, it brings me back to that old, uh, that old saying of the industrial revolution and its yeah. consequences have been a yeah. disaster for the human race, man. Yeah. Uh, you know, as, as you said, like spending time in nature, it, it can be such a powerful teacher to someone and, yep. and even pushing it further from that seeing the world i think that you know one of the beautiful things that we have now uh, that my generation is very entwined with is the internet and because of this while we might also be exposed to echo chambers and you know marketing and, yeah. and all of these things i think that we are uh exposed to a lot of different world views you know yeah. like they're back back in the day and whatnot you know there, there would be that weird guy and he went and he traveled instead of going to university and he was like the coolest person you'd know he was like the old hippie uh my my reference for that would be i used to work at a retirement home that was my first ever job nice. i would work uh, and i met a lot of different people who lived these very storied lives and the coolest one of them the nicest old man i ever met his name was mr powell rest in peace mr powell one time but he joined the peace corps right out of right out of school he got out of school and he joined the peace corps and he traveled the world and he was able to get different perspectives from different people uh, and because of that he was like the wisest old man i knew yeah. and his perspective about you know things like working and thing and, and the world around him was very different than everybody else in that uh in that area but like my generation too like we're exposed to the internet we yeah. we can talk to people from around the world instantly like my one of my best friends in the world he lives in the UK and I've, I've met him one time in person. Um, but that, that's my best friend. And, you know, that wouldn't be possible years and years ago. Uh, so, you know, we're exposed to people from different cultures and different backgrounds with different opinions uh, in the same way that people who travel are. Yeah. Um, easier and easier. And with this, uh, our, our thoughts are changing. Our priorities are changing. Uh, you know, there's there's some there's some great things from that old mindset 
that that I think need to be kept, like the ability to work hard and to persevere. Yes. Like that's something that the older generation have that, you know, us damn kids today, us fucking millennials, <laughs> like we don't have uh to the same degree i would say but also too like the the millennial gen x gen z yeah whatever that like more more open approach and more in, in tune with emotions and like going to therapy like everyone i know goes to therapy now like back if you brought that up in like the 60s or something like oh you go to the nut house once a week <laughs> right, oh right. crazy uh right but like no we're getting we're getting more in tune and in touch with stuff and i think with that and with these shifting priorities and worldviews that our relationships with substances are changing. And maybe, maybe it's one changing the other, maybe it's the other changing the one. Uh, you know, I, I can't speak to that. I can only speak to my experience and say that from my experience, it has vastly altered my worldview and the way that I see and perceive those around me. Um, and you know, I hope that everyone can get that. And as you said too, yeah. it's not even just intoxicants, it's things like breath work and yeah. meditation and time in nature, like all these things that we were told like aren't important are like so important. <laughs> like we're not, I don't know if people who are listening know this, but like we're not designed to sit behind a desk for 40 hours a week. We're designed to be out in nature and yeah. be like hunting shit and, and to be interacting and building and solving problems. So, you know, uh, do things that are outside of your wheelhouse and outside of your comfort zone and things that people might might view as weird or kooky whatever it is because it's gonna yeah. it's gonna grow you as a person and it's gonna nourish who you are uh and, and it's gonna change things it's just gonna change things so much i love it like i love a lot of the language you're using like you know, think of think of the contrast between digital and nomad. Like you're building this bridge between a digital nomad. Yeah, I know that's not your term, but I love the way you're using the language, growing and nourishing. And when you take from the planet, like if you take some mushrooms or you take some cannabis, it's interesting that it acts like a magnet and it tries to pull you outside. It's like you're becoming part of the planet when you ingest it and you're like drawn to it. You know, like the one of the best things to do for people that may not know is if you smoke some cannabis, take some mushrooms, go to, go to the ocean and like just be immersed back into the, to the ocean on some level. And it's, it's fascinating to, to, to think about what you consume pulls you towards it in some way. It's, it's fascinating to think about, but, and as I'm talking about that, it makes me think of education. Here's another avenue we can explore that we haven't touched on yet is this world of cannabis, cannabis education, and, and, and uh, maybe, medical devices that are working with cannabis. Here's another avenue that we could touch on. I, I know a lot of people that are working with Canada or the UK and because regulations are coming out, they're spending a lot of time coming up with cannabis education. Maybe you could speak to that a little bit. Like what does that market look like? It's, it's interesting. Actually, yeah. I come from a bit of a background in cannabis education. I used nice. to train teams and dispensaries, uh, and I, I have helped different, uh, what, which will remain unnamed organizations develop, <laughs> develop training. Cause I'm about to say some shit that they're not, gonna I hear you. <laughs> um, but I, I developed these training modules for people. And okay. I think that a certain level of cannabis education and training should be standard, should be, right. should be, it. there should be a university course right now in in cannabis mm -hmm. there is something like plant science yep what, whatever well we want to whatever we want to call it there should there should be something for that for people to specialize in the same way that, that we don't just have regular engineers we have aerospace engineers we have you know rocket engineers yep. like you know we should be able to specialize like if you are really into biology and you're a nerd for the plant like me like go ahead and learn and learn about cannabis there should be a program for you what i will say is that there's a lot of everyone's trying to be first to market, right? Like everyone wants to be yeah. the premier cannabis education. I have done countless cannabis education courses. I am a twice certified cannabis sommelier. And with this experience, what I'll say is that like, there's no standard for it. Anyone, any, any of you listening right now <laughs> could go on like Coursera and make a cannabis training course and say that you're going to give someone a certification, but like, and I'll push this further in one minute. <laughs> like, what does that certification mean? Like, there's no governing board over it. There's no, like, uh, pot council who are going to be like, mm, yes, this is the right one. So everyone's doing it right now, and they're selling knowledge that, like, realistically, you can just access on the internet. That's where they yeah. accessed it. Go go find it. Just go read. You don't need yeah. a fancy diploma, a fancy uh, a certificate saying that you are whatever. I have a certificate that says I'm a master certified grower. 
I can't grow weed for the life of me, no matter how many times I try. I might have that science knowledge behind it. I can't grow it myself. It just doesn't work for me. But my, you know, my boss, he doesn't have that same background in education, but he put his time in and he can grow some of the best weed. It was we had a Thanksgiving dinner as a team recently, and uh, the centerpiece was uh, was a cannabis plant that he had uh, grown, and it was beautiful. It, nice. it was like better than any centerpiece I've ever seen. But you know, pushing it further, you know, this isn't just me shitting on uh, on cannabis education courses and saying like that they're just trying to take your money. Uh, some are, some are absolutely, but like so are so are universities. Right. Yeah. Like you don't need you can go and learn anything. We have the Internet now, you guys like you can all of human information is is on this accessible point where you can go and you can learn and you can go and read up the need for certification. You might have it. Maybe your job requires it like a, like a university degree, a college diploma. And, you know, there are a lot of a lot of courses in university and college that are really, really helpful. But there are a lot of them. What the fuck do they do, man? Like a philosophy major. I love philosophy majors. I know a lot of them. But we can also <laughs> just smoke weed and read Kant by ourselves. We don't need a, a governing body, someone to be like, oh, yes, you think about philosophy mm. in a way that deserves a diploma versus you. Sorry, buddy. Try again next year. That'll be another $40,000, please. You know, uh, education is needed. Uh, it is needed for plant science. We need more research right. into cannabis. But at the same time, the current courses that I see existing are not worth anyone's time. They're they're not worth your time. They're not worth your money because that at the end of the day is what they're trying to get. They're a business at the end of the day. They're not government funded, research focused. They're people trying to make money and carve out their own niche in the industry and be known as like the the prince of pot, a name that every stoner has like given himself in the, in the industry at a certain point, right? Like... Like, go ahead, learn, go get knowledge, go, go talk to people with different worldviews than you go mm -hmm. see, you know, learn about cannabis from going and seeing fields and people who cultivate it and talk to them there, go on the internet and read like the science behind it. But like, don't feel the need to chase a fancy certification. I should know I have three of them and they have done nothing for my career. If anything, they have slowed me down because then I got into a mindset that other people uh, had taught me rather than thinking for myself and using the research to uh, to guide me and my uh, my opinions forward. It's, it's fascinating to think about. On some level, I think it echoes back to an earlier part of our conversation where certifications, I'll say it this way, when the instrument becomes an institution, mm -hmm. that's when the corruption sets in. So if we look at cannabis as an instrument and all of a sudden there's an institution behind it, a governing body, okay, well now it no longer is as sharp, no longer, no longer works because now there's a controlled set of ideas around it. This is the right way to do it. Well, who gets to say that? It's like saying the greater good, you know, it's, it's these ideas that we contain everything in. And like you said, I, I do think there's a, clearly there's a, there's room for education, clearly that there's room for, you know, particular soil samples and particular methods of growing and Maybe there's there, there is room for education, but certification is a very tricky thing. You know, it's a very, especially when you start getting a lot of money behind it, right? Because money tends tends to tends to corrupt things in strange ways. You know, what about? Here's another one I've been thinking about. What about medical devices? Are you aware of any sort of medical devices that are out there in the world of cannabis? Yeah, yeah, there's uh there's a lot of like medical side to it. I mean, I can more so speak to the recreational. Over sure. here in Canada, we only have one government approved medical device. Okay. And it's something that a lot of people might recognize, the volcano, the Storts of Bickle volcano is the only like Health Canada approved medical device for consuming cannabis. Uh, and, and I think that like when it comes down to to medical devices, it's it's really the shift from mm. uh from combustion uh into the other ways right people are using things ah. like nano emulsification to to create drinks that bind to the receptors a lot better it can be absorbed under your tongue sublingually mm -hmm. rather than waiting and going through the i believe it's the liver like an edible would right. so you know we're seeing a lot of innovation happen i uh, i work with uh one company who will remain nameless for now just in case they don't want me talking about them but they make like the coolest infusions ever. Like I have it over in my kitchen, 
a uh, a bottle and it's 100 milligrams in the bottle and you can pour out and it perfectly doses you 10 milligrams mm. every single time and this can be taken like a shot um i don't think i you know people mix it in with drinks too that's what i've been using it for i've been making cannabis cocktails i've been i've been jokingly making with my friends we yeah. lean that's what we do we put it in some sprite and put like the two jolly ranchers in it and now instead <laughs> of consuming like an opioid drink it, it's a little bit of thc and it's this beautiful beautiful thing uh so yeah we are seeing medical science get pushed forward a little bit in regards to cannabis but i will say recreational has actually slowed down the process mm. on medical because mm. beforehand that's why all these weed companies got into it they did medical because that's the only way they could yeah. legally sell cannabis and now that it's recreational they don't need to give a fuck why would they go and target like the small group of people who are medical when instead they could target everybody and you know by proxy also the people who consume medically from a dispensary so you know people are slowing down and that uh, that focus on medical has really really shifted um away and it, it's a really sad thing to see because patients deserve deserve choice and proper access and proper information to be able to consume their plant medicines uh but we're not seeing that as much i thought when cannabis would be legalized we'd see a boom of it but in yeah. fact it's it's gone the other way yeah it's interesting when you look at for-profit cannabis companies they all seem to be losing market share on some level. What, what, what do you think? Maybe you could speak to the idea of, cause you've been around it a long time. And mm -hmm. some people say that it's, it's losing ground. Like it's losing the luster that it had. Like, what do you think about the commercialization of cannabis and, and what it's done to the industry? Oh, oh, good question. <laughs> I hate it. I hate it. But then again, like I, my online name that I go by is hippie. I, I have, you know, I got called to that in dispensaries. That right. was my nickname working there and the name that I would operate under because it wasn't legal what I was doing. Uh, so I have that old school hippie mentality with it. I think the commercialization uh, is the bastardization of cannabis. Mm. I think that cannabis has this really beautiful, rich history of, of being for the outsiders. Uh, you know, whether that is like in San Francisco uh, yeah. being used to treat uh, people who are dying of AIDS and to give them a little bit of comfort. It was it was the outsider's thing you know uh I, I believe there was some some cannabis ties to stonewall uh, i don't want to i don't want to get into that too much i i, I don't want to speak to that and, and come off like an idiot um but you know it, it was this beautiful thing for the outsiders to have and then the way that the industry went is it pushed it into this rapid commercialization of mm -hmm. it where the people who had the industry on their back for years and took care of people and made sure that people had access to good, clean, reliable cannabis, they were pushed out of it, right? Like the company that I worked for was huge back in the day. You could you could find them in nearly every city. There was multiple in every city. You know, I, I think in Ottawa, we had like three or four of them and then competitors on top of that. I think they have one legalized cannabis store mm -hmm. right now. Those growers who used to provide yeah. really, really great medicines for people, well, they don't have uh, the access to funds that big tobacco and big liquor has to go and get ACMPR certified and, and to build these multi-million dollar facilities. And then at the, at the same time, everyone jumped in, all these big companies jumped into cannabis and were referring to it as the green rush, which <laughs> makes me want to vomit. That's <laughs> so disgusting. Um, but uh, you know, we had former cops. So a lot of these companies are owned by former police officers or have former former rcmp guys on their board and i'm not saying they're all bad but also right. acab they were part of the system that was criminalizing this for a long time putting people in jail for just trying to feed their families off of off of cannabis and now they're trying to make millions and millions of dollars off of it and mm -hmm. it's not happening because they are so discon just disconnected from the consumer a, a, a popular phrase that I've heard from going to all these different cannabis exos and speaking at them is, well, I don't personally consume cannabis, but, and then they give it an explanation on cannabis. And while I don't think you need to be a con uh, an active regular consumer, right. you don't need to be a stoner like me to be able to deserve a place in the industry. If you don't smoke it, you have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> you, you are so disconnected from it. And that's why, you know, all these companies that, got millions and millions of dollars of investment to their stock prices were like, like $20 a share. Um, I, I own some cannabis stocks, but I do it as a meme because they're 10 cents. 
right like <laughs> cannabis stocks are like 10 cents you can go own like a good chunk of a cannabis company for less money than like a starbucks coffee these days um and that comes from these companies being disconnected, not understanding what people want, and also not listening to feedback. I'm really fortunate that I work with companies that are listening yeah. to the feedback that I provide and the feedback that uh, my team goes and collects out in the field and makes calls based off of that. That being said, like not everyone does it. They have this like old school boomer mentality of, nope, this is the way it's going to be. They're going to want it. Yeah. Yeah, of course, people are going to wa want to buy my overpriced mids. <laughs> like the thing that they forget too is they're still competing against Legacy. Legacy didn't go away. I have two stores, right? I have two legal stores right by me and I have two Legacy stores right by me. For legal reasons, I go, I shop at the licensed stores, but. Sure. <laughs> The, the good weed exists at only one. I'm telling you that, or no, they exist at both. There's a, there's a right. lot of good people on the market. Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm being silly. Uh, there's a lot of great people on the market and a lot of great people making great cannabis, but there is equal amount of bad actors uh, and people who are just in it for the money. And if you're just in it for the money, I mean, look at the space right now. There's yeah. no money to be had. If you're getting into cannabis now, you better be doing it because you fucking love it <laughs> because you're passionate about it. And and same thing, if you have that passion, you know, speaking to what we said earlier about storytelling, yeah, that's going to come off to consumers and that's going to come off in your brand and you're going to be better received than the cop weed. I'll tell you that much. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, I, I, in some ways, I feel like there's a new mythology around cannabis being born and someone who was wise could harness that because you know, earlier in the conversation, we talked about the the power of buying a new strain came from a story like oh yeah this is so and so or this is this kind and and now it's it's it seems like there's an absence of a story but you know nature abhors a vacuum so a new story is rushing in on some level being able to tell the new mythology or create it as you go along could open up and and maybe, maybe that's why there's so many you know I, I got tons of friends that that slang on the side and like they're just as good as a dispenser not even if better because it's the guy that grew it in his house you know what i mean and it's like oh yeah i know this guy Dude, and you know what i know his uncle and his uncle's been growing ever since he was a kid and this guy and in some ways there's like a lineage there you know and it harkens back to the ways in which things used to be grown and but but now you can have that lineage and you can have the turp profile you could send that into like a you know the cult of our cup with doma nunzio's gig and you know you could figure out you can have the best of both worlds what do you when, and then maybe this gets back to branding. What do you see emerging or do you see potential for a new story to be told about Canis? And what are you doing to harness that? Yeah, I think I think a, a new story needs to be told right now. A big a big issue that we have right now facing the Canadian industry okay. is inflated THC values. Okay. So so this has been a huge issue for a long time. Of and this is and this happens because consumers have been cut off. Like how how do you buy weed right like mm -hmm. you sniff it right like you sniff right. it and you look at it and maybe maybe if you know the guy well enough you gotta touch the bud uh and <laughs> totally. like really get a get this like full-on experience with it and that's how you chop by what smells the best yeah right now because of cannabis packaging you know i have i should have some so like this is how a cart comes now okay. right like it's 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 locked off from you you can't see it you can't look at it you have no idea what you're getting so what do what do people gravitate towards? They gravitate towards that THC label. Yep. That that automatic readout right there. And because of this, we have seen a race to the bottom occur in the cannabis industry where everybody doesn't care about producing great, beautiful cannabis in the same way that we used to. They're worried about THC values. So mm -hmm. they're they're shopping. Not everybody, but a lot of brands are shopping around to different testing facilities that will inflate their test results, or they'll work to inflate their test results themselves by like all, all that keef that like fell off the flower in, in the trimming process they for their lab samples are just rolling it in that keef and they're making sure it's covered. So we're getting inflated THC labels of like 35% THC. Mm -hmm. I've I've seen as high as 39% THC, which oh, wow. from a genetic standpoint is pretty well impossible. Like that <laughs> shit would kind of be like that shit would be crystalline. It would look more like crack than cannabis at that point <laughs> if it's 40% THC. Um, so we're seeing this race at the bottom occur where everyone is just worried about THC because consumers have been cut off from the plant. 
So they're not able to shop in the way that they should be shopping. They can't shop by smell and aroma and by and by the vibe that they want. So they break it down to numbers. And it's like the cannabis equivalent of like going in and be like, I want a nice bottle of wine. What has the highest alcohol percentage? In it? Mm-hmm. Well, you're leaving with a bottle of Everclear. That's what yeah. you're leaving with. Yeah. So, so there's room right now for cannabis brands to really be telling great stories. And I'm looking forward to a cannabis brand emerging and not giving a fuck about it. And saying, you know what, instead of spending all this money shopping around to a lab that's going to say that we have the strongest stuff on the market. Instead, I'm going to put my marketing budget into making sure that every store has a display sample like like cannabis brands fucking steal this from me. Okay, steal this from me right now. Mm -hmm. You don't need to pay me Mm -hmm. for this. Take your big, beautiful buds that you're like, wow, I wish someone could see it and case it in resin to make sure it lasts forever and it doesn't go brown in a sensory jar in a dispensary because once cannabis has been exposed to like oxygen right. for for a, and light for a certain amount of period it degrades it doesn't look as good do that invest in scratch and stiff snickers stickers with that so that way you can show yeah. someone the bud and be like here is the bud that you're going to buy this is what it looks like it's beautiful right perfect smell this this is you know the terpenes we extracted from it and this is the smell and kind of the flavors that you're going to get off of it because right now it's it's a race to the bottom because of thc so we need people to come in and find creative ways to market their flower we need to find people that don't give a shit and are able to communicate that hey good weed isn't a percentage that's never been what it's about and that should never be what it's about so like here's here's our cannabis here's our yeah. story behind it here's why we believe in our product here's who it's for and, and here's why it matters i love it i'll give you i'll give i'll give the cannabis industry one too so someone out there take this idea mm-hmm. create a strain that nobody can have like this is a strain but you have to read you have to read this book before you can get it and you could you could sell the book right there, like Carl Jung's Red Book or a, a philosophy book. Since we're talking about philosophy, why not have a strain of weed that that corresponds to personality types? You know, like why not? You have to read this book before you can have this strain. No one can get it, but you have to read this book. You know, and then all of a sudden people are like, why do I read a stupid book to do it? Well, because if you want to understand what this does, you have to read this. Another way, and I think there's something that goes with that too is. The idea of a personality test. We don't thoroughly understand how terpenes affect different people. Like we understand these different profiles have different attributes, but how do you measure that against someone's individual DNA code? It's very difficult to measure all those variables. But what you could do is you could have people take a personality test, like the Briggs Myers or the DISC, and then you could begin to match up those personality types with terpene profiles. And I think that now you're looking at something that doesn't have to do with THC content. You're getting away from these big boomer brands that want to put a big number on there. Like it's a sunscreen number, like SPF 50, you know, you're just making stuff up, man. Have something real behind it. Oh, you're a, you're a IFNJ. Chances are you're going to like this particular terpene profile. And here's why we think that, you know, now you have something tangible that you can measure against. And I think that that is the new way that stories evolve is like, wow, this is my character profile. Here is this personality test. Here is this thing I like. Well, I'm also that personality and I also like that. Now you have this whole new avenue of creating, you're tying together behavior, terpene profiles. And and in the same way, you're creating a community of like-minded people. Like now you got a whole community around it instead of it just being, you know, it, it, it harkens back to the idea of a boutique and a, and a product that comes with that boutique instead of just some mass selling of THC. But I think that we've only begun to scratch the surface of storytelling, imagination, and what is possible in the cannabis industry. I think people like you and, and some of the real thought leaders out there, my friend Alex would hate that I use the word thought leaders, but I'm sorry, Alex, I'm using the word. I can't think of anything else, Alex. So, but yeah, the, some of the thought leaders out there can really begin to create this new story. What, what do you think about personality tests and archetypes and cannabis being put together as a, as a system? I think it's a very interesting idea. I think that it's something that like should be explored um, from, from a, from a retail perspective uh, as someone who's in the store. I don't, I, you're going to have a hard time getting people to do that, man. You're going to have a hard time, but I still think that that could be, 
you know, like oversimplify it, right? Like that's right. what we need to do for a lot of these consumers, right? Okay. You even say the name terpene, you say a terpene to like a lot of consumers and they're like, what now? What's that fancy 10 cent <laughs> word you slanging at me, boy? I'm trying to get high. And you're like, yeah, I, I know, Daryl. I know you're just trying to get high, but like, I'm trying to help you have this experience right now. I think that, yeah, taking that and making cannabis and, and choosing cultivars and and, uh, and terpene profiles and cannabinoid profiles that match maybe experiences mm. or how you want yes. to feel might be a really smart way to go about it in the future. Uh, I think like a, and I think there's one cannabis company that's doing it right now. I think uh, Color does, but they have color, color coordinated cannabis. They have every cultivar like it. has its own color and it stands out. And a lot of a lot of like old school color theory, uh, just mm. fun marketing stuff goes into yeah. that, right? You choose it based on the color you see. So like they have this really beautiful sativa called Pedro's Sweet Sativa. And I believe it's in like a bright green container, like this, like a bright green bag. So it stands out and it pops out and it's fun. And then they have uh, it's Black Sugar Rose, which is in a, uh, a darker, like a maroon red one. It has that more like calm vibe for it. I think too, though, that as you said, with personality types, that could be a really great uh, like culture piece that a yeah. brand could use to differentiate themselves. Like put that on your website. Like maybe don't have like a full on, like don't make them like Myers Brig or whatever like that. <laughs> but maybe like Buzzfeed it. You know what I mean? Like yeah. make a like choose choose what looks best mm. to you. Choose what book looks most interesting to you. All of these things to get an idea of that consumer that is going to be consuming the product and then guiding them to a product that you think that they would really honestly enjoy. I mean, I've been I've been workshopping uh my own brand for okay. better part of 2 years now. I think I've been working on it for like 3 years like off and on touch and go. Uh, I'm debating who I want to to sell it to right now because uh i i think the execution is going to be yes. everything with it but it, it's a brand that's that pushes people away and it's like no 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 this isn't for everyone this is i for love it i love this it. person this is for this kind of person who is doing this kind of thing and then there's a little bit of like specialization and personalization in there but i think the problem right now and, and the one that we see is everyone's trying to make a brand that resonates with everybody and when you try to resonate right. with everybody you matter to nobody Yes, that's well said. Yeah, it's. I guess it comes back to that idea of of people would rather have one percent of a thousand people or one percent of a hundred people than a hundred percent of one person. And, and I, from a marketing standpoint or from a profit standpoint, I get it. But I don't. If the name of the game is money, then it's not health. It's not becoming better. It's not moving forward. It's just money and it's just extraction. And it doesn't we, like, we can look at the world as a whole and realize that extraction on a mass scale just leads to more extraction. Like there mm -hmm. has to be something behind it that moves it. You know, I, when I think back to wonderful marketing and, and, and I think back to the idea of, of the first Apple computer at the Super Bowl when they, they showed all these IBM guys like marching off a cliff like lemmings, you know, and like here's this one guy that's like, I'm not gonna sit in an office. Like, how do you how do you stand out from everybody else? Well, you have to be willing to piss people off. You have to be willing to turn your back on the crowd if you want to be the conductor. And that's where courage comes in and authenticity comes in. And so much of these these things that we're talking about instill that and Maybe that's why on some level they're, they're maybe, like you said, maybe they're not for everybody. Maybe this is something that is best in a niche circle or you know, sometimes good advice is, is kept to a handful of people because they know how to use it or they know how to wield it. Or even if you look at indigenous cultures, like you have to reach a certain age before you're even able to serve medicine. You have to study behind somebody for a long time before you understand what's really happening out there. And when you give it to the masses, it sort of cheapens it a little bit. What do you think? Yeah, no, I, I think that's that's definitely it. It's you need to find some specialization. You need to find, uh, for better lack of words, find your tribe, right? Like find yeah. the people who are going to yep. resonate with your brand and, and, and appeal to them. I think a, a really beautiful example that we can take from, uh, I'll say the rolling paper industry. So I say the cannabis industry, it might get these guys in trouble. Okay. But like raw, like the okay. story of raw is really beautiful. Uh, and I look to Josh Kesselman from that as like one of the smartest, uh, like best marketers of our time. 
because he had this idea for a brand that he chased and his idea was an all natural rolling paper. So just, uh, I'll tell everyone he has so many interviews online, like maybe pause this. If you're listening to it after the fact, go listen to it. But if you're here with us live, I'll, I'll just reiterate it in uh, not as many floral words. Um, (laughs) he had the idea. He used to sell rolling papers. He used to work in, um, he used to work in like head shops. He had his own thing of head shops in, I think it was Gainesville, Florida or, or Arizona. It was one of the two. I think it was Florida though. Um, and because of this, he would order in rolling papers from all around the world for different people. And he would get really excited from that because uh, he had, he had such a passion for rolling paper. So he was already following his passion, which is like the first yeah. important thing. Um, but then one day he had a customer say, Hey, there's this beautiful all natural rolling paper I really want. Can you get it? And he got excited because he's like, whoa, okay, yeah, I want an all natural rolling paper. And then he ordered it in and he was all excited and it was bleached white. It was this white sheet of paper looking just like a zigzag. Mm. Uh, And he was like, that's like, that's not what natural (laughs) is. Like, and, and, you know, there's a reason that rolling papers were white. It, It comes from back in the day, the fact that people used to smoke, uh, newspaper like that's how they would that was original rolling papers so the companies would come out and have a bleached white paper to be like look it's hygienic it's it's clean there's no ink you're not smoking heavy metals on it so like it made sense then but like as we move into a more and more natural thing he was like no like that's not natural that's not what we need so he you know he went and he he invested in himself and he got an order of it because he would go to all these big rolling paper companies and be like, Hey, uh, I want to do this natural rolling paper. You know, it, it'll look like this. It's unbleached. It's, Oh, now I have my rolling paper. I'll screw it up. I'll, I'll fold that back <laughs> up later. Uh, but he's like, it's unbleached. It's beautiful. It, you know, it has a natural gum line, you know, like this is really natural. And they, they would joke to him and they would say, man, no one wants to smoke a paper bag. Are you kidding me? Like no one wants to, but he had this image in his mind of like, I think he said it was like a beautiful hippie girl smoking. He's like, I want to make yeah. the thing for her, for the, you know, the, the white girl with long dreads with like seashells gone into it. And her dad might be like a, a big finance guy, but like, she doesn't <laughs> care. She's not, she's not a part of that. So he made the paper for those people. He made it for not for everybody. Yeah. Um, and, and he started selling it and it got passed around in the way that cannabis used to and and cannabis products used to be able to uh, be talked about it not from marketing campaigns not from you know ads on porn sites which we're seeing more and more but from circles people would smoke together and someone would pull out a pack of rods and someone would be like yo what is that yeah and they would smoke it themselves they'd have an experience with it and they'd ask about it so he made something that wasn't for everybody and now it's like arguably the biggest rolling paper company in the world like this is the one i i see everybody smoke it i i see it in every dispensary it's always handed out anytime someone offers me a joint it is often rolled in one of those unless they have like a weird preference maybe they want a flavored paper whatever so you know he went and he targeted a specific niche and then it became for everybody because of just the quality of the product and the vision behind the mm. product. And maybe maybe you weren't the hippie person with the long dreads going down or the long unkept hair, but you'd see them smoking and you're like, oh, yeah, I, I want to be a part of that. That looks yep. cool. I, I have my corporate nine to five, but maybe that's how yeah. I really feel. Right. So he was able to make this brand that that resonated with a certain group of people and then resonated outside of that just based on quality cannabis we're we're seeing the opposite happen a lot of time of people are trying to make something that resonates with everybody and because of that maybe some niche circles like it but other than that it's not growing i love it you know and i think on some level it speaks to the idea of how easy it should be right now and you know i think it was von clausewitz who said that you know everything in in war everything in war is easy The only problem is in war, even the easy things are incredibly difficult. What I mean by that is that when the market's saturated by normality, when the market is saturated by average, all it really takes is for someone to come in and see that diamond in the rough, whether it's the the girl that has seashells or flowers in her hair or, and, and yeah, I'm targeting that. But in targeting that, you're targeting this giant thing of beauty that you see that other people see, but they don't really know that they want it. Now, all of a sudden, the people that want those, they're they're buying that girl's image. They're buying that circle. They're buying an hour of coolness. They're buying the 
the trip to the dead show without actually going to it. They're getting some of that, that story into them. It's contagious in a way. And I, I do think that I think when it comes to creating anything, you know, a, a great story about this too, is uh, there used to be a company called airwalk. And I remember mm -hmm. coming up like, Dude, all the cool skaters had airwalk shoes, but there was two kinds of airwalks. There was like the cool airwalks you could only get at like the surf shops and like some of the pro skaters wore. And then there was the airwalks that you could get like at Sears or something like that. But everybody knew, you know, because there was a cool version and a not cool version. But that cool factor is something that marketing has drawn on forever. And it's just a matter of creating that cool factor. That cool factor is always out there. It's just a matter of tying your product to that cool factor and then giving it to an audience. But if you give it to too big of an audience, not cool anymore what, what do you is that what do you think about the cool factor in, in that aspect of it that sound kind of sounds like the raw thing in some ways is that, yeah. is that similar yeah i think it, i think it's similar as as i as i love to say to people i'm like cannabis isn't cool anymore when you get enough a fully federal yeah. legal yeah. thing because it because it becomes for everybody right like it's yeah. no longer something for the outsiders but like that's okay too and there's allowed to be cool things yeah. in it you're allowed to have that and and there always is going to be that to exist so like right now like there are cannabis companies in canada that like have that cool factor ghost nice. drops is the biggest one man they're cool as hell i buy their stuff because i want to i'm not a rapper i don't i mean i used to do a little bit of music but i i'm not anywhere like on that level so you know i buy that because i'm like i'm smoking the rapper's weed right now <laughs> that's really cool yeah right um and, and i and i connect with that and and as you said it's yeah. it, it's buying that experience for yep. the hour um you know it's the same reason that like you see like these really cool like kind of niche coffee shops yep. uh and then dudes in suits are going in there because they're holding on to that little yeah. part of them right they're yep. holding on to that yeah i'm gonna go buy it from the cool little place i'm not going to starbucks yeah, yeah. or you have people like me who are going to starbucks i'm like oh look at me i'm a big business <laughs> yeah boy. I, I exist in this world now <laughs> so yeah like the cannabis cool factor is is dying is nearly dead but like there there are going to be brands that sure. uh, that target on that there are going to be brands that carve it out for themselves you know ghost drops is one great one another great brand who who doesn't make quote unquote weed for everybody ministry of sativa i did uh did an article about them forever ago and they were like we're just growing sativa fucking indica fucking indica dominant hybrid mm -hmm. we are growing sativas we are hunting for land race because we're going to be for the sativa people mm -hmm. it's okay to not like sativa dominant yeah. products but then this isn't for you. And because of that, the people who love Sativa love their products. And I see it get adopted, yeah. you know, very often. Um, so yeah, people, you know, just don't don't worry about what other people are doing. Like have have an image in your yeah. head. And yeah. Chase that image and find that like bit of bit of story that is authentic to you. Because if you do that, people are going to resonate with it. They might not be a rapper. But they love rap music and they kind of want to feel like one for a little bit, you know? Yeah. Authenticity is contagious, especially in a world where in a world of sameness, authenticity is contagious. And I think that that is a roadmap for people to follow. I, I like it. And it's it's there's something to be said about it. I, I It seems like there's so much homogenization that's constantly trying to happen. There's mcdonald's on every corner you go to anywhere in the world to get the same cheeseburger and that's cool you go to a starbucks and get the same kind of coffee and that's cool consistency is awesome but there's something to be said about that edge that little bit of dangerousness like wow this person's going against the grain right here man this is different you know and you get to be part of that difference you know and i, I like that part i i i i really think that that's that's industry do, do you do you think that what do you think about transparency in the cannabis industry? Is that something that has become greater with normalcy or is that something that's kind of been shrouded? It's something that's shrouded now. I mean, it's always been a certain level of shrouded, right? Cause you're buying okay. a legacy market and people yeah. are protecting their sources, but that came from a protection standpoint, right? Okay. That's a, Hey man, you could be a narc and this is a <laughs> like a family grower yeah. and we don't want them to like lose their family farm. Right. Now it comes from like that corporate side of it, right? Of just like, oh, they don't need to know. They don't, <laughs> they don't need to know that. And, and like, fair enough, you know, no one, no one needs to know everything, but like there, there's shrouding of it. And like one of the biggest things is like companies changing the, the names of their products, which is fair. Mm. If you, you know, every, every grow of a cultivar is going to be a little bit different, right. but you know, we have like 
so many wedding cakes on market right now and then people are going ahead and they're like changing the name a little bit to stand out You're like, but that's not what that is anymore right <laughs> it's like yep. taking a pinot grigio and calling it uh the pinot best grigio of all time <laughs> ever you're like okay that's like i can see kind of baseline what that is but like that's right. that's not it like people are hiding a, a lot of information uh and, and they shouldn't be like they should be open and transparent yes. and find people who who resonate with that and i'm i'm fortunate in that my company we are choosy about who we work with we're now at that point where like we have yeah. said no to people because they didn't fit what we wanted to do and the goals that we have in the industry for for marketing uh we we find those people who who are really trying to do great things and hey regardless if anyone's here listening feel free to hit me up we can have a conversation right um but you know that being said you know we we find those people that resonate with it and that understand kind of where the industry is now and how to guide it to where we want to get it right so and a big thing with that is transparency like with all of the brands that i work with you better be ready to show me a coa if I have a group of people mm. going into dispensaries and talking about how your flower is like over 30%, cool. I want to see a way to back that up. Yeah. And I want that to be from a reputable lab or, or it's not even worth me having. If it's from like Joe Blow's basement, uh, yeah. basement pharma, it's not going to help. <laughs> or, you know, there's, there's some names in the industry that everyone kind of knows they're like, Oh yeah, those don't trust those COAs. Like those are inflated. <laughs> um, right. So like, I'm like, Hey man, you gotta have those COAs ready. Cause people are going to want it. If you're selling something, over 30% THC, which isn't impossible, especially with the right cultivar and the right mm. growers and the right conditions. Like you can do it, but it's really tough. And you better be ready to prove that on the market because consumers are, are getting more discerning. They're, they're sick of the bullshit. They've went and they've got a 35% THC product. And they're like, this hits like the 18% I got. But that being said, <laughs> THC isn't everything. There's other cannabinoids. There's other yeah. substances that you are breathing in. There's terpenes. There's, you know, everything guides it. So, you know, it, people, there needs to be new trans, uh, transparency, a certain level in the industry. You don't need to volunteer every bit of information, but if you're touting your product is this, you better be ready to back it up. Yeah, it's interesting. There's a lot of there's a lot of people exploring the I might I, sometimes I say this wrong, but the cannabinoid system, like the cannabinoid, you know, you, you start to hear a lot of people talking about it. But it seems really complex to me. It seems like there's so many variables in there. And and how do we measure that? What but then again, I I, I read a lot of research. You'll read some papers, you'll talk some, to some people that you know you really respect and you understand that wow, this is you know, a nanomite is lighting up this neurotransmitter system. And it's interesting to think about all the work that's around that. What's your take on, on that whole sort of emergence of the cannabinoid system and how it might affect the industry going forward? Yeah, like the, the focus on the ECS system right now okay. is something really great. And I think that, you know, it should be talked about. Yeah. Is it the way that I want to sell cannabis personally? No, I think I think the way to sell cannabis and to really resonate and to to do well is to bring it back to the old school because that's mm -hmm. what people want, man. People people want. I, I hate to say it, but people want to go into a dispensary and buy weed from a guy that looks like me, who's like covered in tattoos, <laughs> looks like he has a bit of a bad attitude, right? Uh, right? Like people kind of want that experience. They don't want like I've seen. I've seen. I've gone to stores, man, and people are in like full on suit and ties. I'm like, what the fuck. You're going to narc on me, man. I know it's legal, but you're a narc. Like if I've ever seen one, um, you know, like people want that experience. And I think that I personally think that it should be brought back to the old way. Yeah. You should be talking about the cannabinoids that you want to do. And there should be all your products should be tested, you know, so you should yeah. understand what is in that product before you sell it. Um, but you know, like sell it based off the beauty factor, sell it off of how rich those buds are and how they smell and how fresh it is. That's the, the way that I want to see the industry grow. Speaking uh, about the way the industry is and how it will realistically yeah. grow. I think, yeah, like conversations about the ECS system like need to be had. Uh, and like the, the sad thing is that it it goes down to the bud tenders to do it because brands mm. are going ahead and they're labeling, oh, this is a CBG product. This one has CBN. This has CBD, you know, like they're labeling it with that. And now these like underpaid retail workers are the one that have to explain complex biology uh, to people like twice right. their age. Um, so like there needs to, the, you know, we were talking a little bit about education. There needs to be yeah. more education in the industry, not only for the people who are working in it, 
but for the people who are consuming it, like we need to just normalize some conversations about it and, and be like, Hey man, like, here's what it is. And will every consumer take part in that? Yeah. No. Right. Like there's always people that go into the liquor store and they just grab like whatever looks good off the shelf first. Yeah, absolutely. But then there are also those people that go in there and they want to talk about the typicity of the wine. And they want to talk about the region that it was grown in mm -hmm. and where it was produced. And we should be ready to have those conversations and to nurture those conversations uh, in a retail environment. But I think the, the biggest thing that needs to happen there is that uh, weed workers, you guys need to, we all need to unionize. We need to unionize. We need to demand better pay. And yeah, some stores are going to fall to the wayside. But at the same time, right now, unfortunately, we're at a point where people are selling their labor very cheap you know when i worked at a dispensary uh, right at the start of the market i was making 20 to 25 dollars an hour i would that's how much i was making um I, I, and then i moved on to salary but then you know i've seen that average wage go down more and more to where now if you work at a dispensary you're earning around minimum wage here in canada and that being said you know there's an old expression i i love to take uh Minimum wage, minimum effort, man, right? If someone's earning minimum wage and you can't expect them to have the knowledge of an expert, you yeah. can't have an expert making beginner wage. That's just not how capitalism is supposed to work. I don't exactly love the system, but it's the one that we're stuck operating under. So let's like, let's be consistent with how we apply it. Right. But there, there's a race to the bottom happening with prices, mm -hmm. uh, with THC labels going up and with how underpaid can these workers be? And it's really, really sad to see because that's, man, I, as I said, I'm, I'm from legacy. I used to go into stores every day and risk my freedom. That's what it was because I believed in it. When I called my old man, the same guy who was going to call the cops on me for a P5 as a teenager, it was still illegal. I had, I had just been uh, let go from a job. I was, uh, I was a manager at a candy store and I went into my dispensary when I was handing out resumes because I was like, I need a fucking joint for this walk home because I just lost my job and this sucks. And I talked to to my now amazing friend and my my former regular bud tender, Brett, and he said, hey, man, do you want to work here? And I was like, yeah, let me let me just and I, I lied. I had my resume with me. I was like, let me go get it. I went outside to call my old man because I was like, oh, he's going to fucking kill me if I do this. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring it by him anyways. Right. So I called him and I said, hey, man. I want, I think I found a new job. And he's like, where, where is it? And I said, it's at a dispensary. And he paused and he said, do you believe in what you're doing? And that's the first time that old man has ever asked me my opinion on anything. <laughs> he's a stubborn bastard. God love him. Uh, and I said, yeah, I do. And he said, then I'll support you full heartedly. And then I went into there and I was, I was risking my freedom every single day. And it wasn't for, for workers to get exploited and for our industry to be simplified and bastardized and, and turned into a consumer packaged goods, mm -hmm. man. I did it because this is an amazing plant. This is produce that if handled correctly, not only can change the people who are consuming it and give them these amazing experiences, but can also make you a lot of money. That's what that's what the corporate people listening to here want to know. They want to know that it's going to make money, and you can do that with authenticity, yeah. with uh, with honesty, transparency, with showing and just growing good products. You can do it. It's tough. It's a crowded market. But guess what? If you're embodying all those values and you're in cannabis because you love it, you already have a leg up on the competition. Yeah, that's well said. And I think that, that that translates to life. If you're doing something you love and you're passionate about, you're ahead of the game. Mm -hmm. You know, it takes a lot of courage to it takes a lot of courage to say, you know what? I love this thing and I'm gonna do it regardless of of the consequences. And I'm gonna I believe in it. And maybe maybe you gotta set a time, I'm gonna do it for a year and see what happens. I'm gonna reevaluate, I'm gonna do it for two years, I'm gonna do it for six months. But to anybody listening to this, that I would encourage you that find something you love to do and work towards it. Take some baby step towards it. And I think that your, your relationships will get better. The stories you tell yourself will get better. The way you model reality will get better, whether it's in cannabis or whether it's being a mechanic. You know, if there's something you love in life, work towards it and your world will get better, man. And, and that's how you, that's how you become an expert. I think in something is by finding your passion and finding something you love and, and playing with it toying with it and experimenting with it and you know I, i'm hopeful that that's that's the way we move forward but yeah i i love to i love to hear that it, it's possible and to understand the lay sometimes you got to understand where you came from to know where you're going right mm -hmm.
Mm-hmm. You got you got to use history to guide it. And what I will say, just yeah. to growing off what you're saying, is like find a passion, yeah, but don't feel the need to monetize it. That's this yeah. gross mentality that we all have these days. You don't need to get fulfillment from work is what I learned. I, I stream in my off time and Mm -hmm. I'm super, I'm lucky that I have two things I'm very passionate about that just so happen to get me paid. I, I turned being a stoner into a career. Somehow I did it. And then I also turned being a guy who likes to play video games and smoke into something that like earns me income and has built me a community. And guess what? It doesn't pay all the bills, but I love it. And I do it because I love it. And just having something in your life that uh that that you do that you're like i'm doing this for me man i'm doing this because i want to do it not because someone told me to not because it's maybe the right thing to do but because i have a genuine passion and interest man you're gonna succeed you're gonna succeed with it i never thought i'd get paid any sort of money to play video games i remember being a kid and be playing video games in the basement my dad would come down you're never gonna make money playing video games get up there and study and now i remind him all the time i'm like hey man (laughs) I just paid like part of my rent by like getting really stoned and playing Call of Duty last <laughs> night. And he's like, he's like, yeah, you were right, man. I hate to say it. And I'm like, yeah, sometimes you're right, man. Chase those passions, chase your gut instincts. Uh, I, I always tell people your gut instinct uh, is always going to be the right one. Always. How did that happen? Like, maybe you can, can you tell us like what that journey was like? Like you're just all of a sudden you're playing, you're like, I'm gonna start streaming this stuff. And then all of a sudden people start checking out your style or how do you go from, from that, from playing the game, smoking some weed to getting paid to do that? It, it's crazy. I'm still trying yeah. to figure it out myself. Really what happened. Um, I, it started for me at the start of quarantine. Okay. Um, I, I got locked inside. I was, I was living with a, with a partner at the time and you know, we were, we were trapped inside and they didn't really like the fact that I was a gamer. I would like game all day. Cause like, that's all I could do. I'd like look for jobs and whatever. And then I would game and they were like, okay. And I was like, well, maybe like, maybe there's something there. And I started watching uh, other Twitch creators, uh, big ones too, that I like pay money. Wubby is a really great example. He's a lovely guy too. I have, I, I've ended up meeting him. He's, he's so funny. And, uh, as he put it, when I told him the story, uh, he said, I was like, I was watching you. And he's like, and then you realized if this dumbass could do it, you could do it. And I was like, yeah, yeah, that's it. I wouldn't use those words. I wouldn't call right, you that. Right, right. But, you know, like I, I've always <laughs> been passionate about about gaming content and about gaming. And and I think that it it's silly, but it offers up a distraction. And, it, and it's something that just engrosses you in the time. Watching someone else play a video game, it brings me back to being a kid. And like sitting in my buddy's mm-hmm. basement and he's doing a really hard level and he's screaming and throwing the controller and whatnot. And I was like, oh, like this is this is fun. And, you know, I, I started doing it. And for a long time, there was nobody. I was streaming to nobody. Yeah. I, I was in my living room. I was sitting on an old barber's chair streaming off my awesome. PlayStation. And I had a um, what was it? I had like just a lamp from Ikea that I would like put it behind me. So like my lighting was fucked up. Um, and I did that there and, and it grew slowly and slowly. And eventually I got a new computer. I, uh, I needed a new computer. I was editing for a company I used to work for and it wouldn't render out. They're like, Oh, we can help you get a new computer. And I was like, all right, cool. And I sent them a gaming rig. I was like, I was like, yeah, this will be good for editing. And they're like, Oh yeah, perfect. Yeah. We'll buy that for you. And I was like, Oh, what the fuck? Okay. I didn't think that would work. Uh, so I got I got this tank of a PC and I started doing it and you know it's it's that thing of like find your tribe don't try to be for everybody. Um, my stream is very specific. It's me being a dumbass. It's me like making jokes that like I'm mortified when people from my real life hear. In fact, I uh, I've I've been seeing a woman lately and she was like, oh yeah, I saw a little bit of it and I was like, I am mortified. I am so sorry <laughs> for what you have witnessed. But, you know, I, I started doing it and, you know, a community started forming around me. And I don't have the biggest community. You know what I mean? There are people on Twitch with hundreds of thousands of views, tens of thousands of views, whatever. Like, that's not me. But I, I have the people that connect with what I do mm-hmm. and like what I do. And they're there every single week, three days a week. And we have a good time. Like, we we get silly. We get goofy. Like, I, you know, it's not just playing video games. We like to, yeah. we, play, we play one game um, where I let them control my Tinder. I get the dating apps up and I let them vote for me. And I'm like, I can't, <laughs> dude, I shouldn't be controlling my own love life. Like I'll let you guys give it a chance um, to mix That's results. It's awesome. to very mixed results. Um, but you know, like little things like that, it's just, you know, it, it, 
it's something I was passionate about. I grew up with a controller in my lap. Uh, there's videos of me. I was so young, I couldn't hold my head up, but I was in my dad's lap playing a World War II flight simulator. And he's like, William, pull up on the joystick. And I'm, <laughs> I'm pulling up, right? So like, I got that instinct in me. I was I was born a gamer. I'm really I'm really fortunate. I, me and my father were able to share that passion together. You know, some people's dads bring them out to th play catch in the backyard. Yeah. My dad would pick up the newest Call of Duty. And he's like, all right, let's get going, my boy. Let's get going. Let's rank up, my dude. Um, so no, it's been something that's always been in my life. And, you know, I, I started doing it exactly as you said, I was like, Hey man, I'm just going to do this for like yeah six months to a year. And if it doesn't come in anything, then you know what? At least I tried, at least I gave it an effort. Uh, and I, I hit affiliate, which is where you can start monetizing your channel. You need to have, and I think it, I think it's like the top 5% of streamers, you need to be in there to get an affiliate T five, five to 15%, right? Like not everyone gets it. The average yeah. viewership on Twitch, when it's broken down from those like tens of thousand channels to the people who are streaming to nobody, the average viewership is two or three people. So it's beating that and doing it there. And I was able to do that within my first month of streaming, even though I didn't have the setup, even though, so I just, I just went for it and, and it worked out. And now it's something that like, I'm so, so passionate about. I do it three days a week. My boss watches my stream. Yeah. He comes in there. Uh, he catches me streaming sometimes when I shouldn't be. Imagine but that. Yeah, no, I've, I've had a couple of times where he's like, hey man, aren't you supposed to be working on a contract right now? And I'm like, <laughs> it's getting done. Don't worry. <laughs> this is me. This is me just relaxing. I'm fighting for freedom right now. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Dude, I'm in the pits of Russia right now fighting for my goddamn <laughs> life, dude. <laughs> I have a gun from 1891 and there's a dude with like a modern setup <laughs> laying down solid fire at me, man. I'm trying to survive right now. I'm trying contract. to contract live. Yeah. <laughs> contract. It doesn't matter when I'm fucking dead. <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> no, nah, but it's, it's been a lovely journey. I, I love it. I, I sh shout out, uh, shout out to my Twitch family. Shout out to the goblin gang. I got a little GG there. Yeah. For them uh it they've given me so much happiness in my life and it's really funny because this community has stuck around longer than all the girlfriends that were telling me it wouldn't be anything so you know what who's laughing now <laughs> janet no that's not her name that's, not, I'm sorry. that's so awesome man oh it's beautiful william i love this conversation man i i feel like i've gotten to learn not only a lot about the cannabis industry but I've gotten to learn a lot about who you are and what makes you tick and why you see things the way you do. And, and in doing that, I get, I get to see this authentic, authentic person. And uh, I've heard a lot of good people say cool things about you, Mark Davis. And, you know, I I've spoken. Mark. Yeah. That guy's amazing. Thanks Mark for all, all the work that you do, man. You're doing a lot of cool stuff out there. And I bet you a lot of the people with whom I speak have, have been affiliated with him or, He's giving them good, good advice or partnering with people. He's like the unsung hero of like the cannabis and the psychedelic industry. He's doing so mm -hmm. much cool stuff out there. So shout out to him. And but yeah, it's interesting to see the connections that are being made in this industry and online and streaming. And I really think that that there's a future for all of us that are steeped in this community. And and I'm looking forward to to being part of it and seeing how it happens. But before I let you go, my friend, where can people find you? What do you have coming up? What are you excited about? What's what's the Twitch channel? What what, what do you got going on, man? Where people can find you at? Uh, if you are in need of any cannabis marketing uh, help at all, go to greenhouse.agency. Uh, that is our website. You can uh, you can contact me there. I'd love to talk about your brand, your idea for a brand, or what you're doing in the industry. Uh, Although, if you work with me in that context, don't go ahead and check me out on <laughs> Twitch uh, over at twitch.tv slash hippiezorn, H-I-P-P-Y-Z-O-R-N. Uh, I'm there three nights a week, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, from about uh, 4 4.20 p.m. EST uh, until late. We'll play some video games. We'll have a chat. We'll have a smoke. Uh, we'll have a good time there. You can also find me uh, under the same handle on YouTube uh, as well as TikTok and uh, Instagram as well. It's all hippie zorn. Fantastic. Well, hang on briefly afterwards. Well, I'd like to talk to yep. you just briefly afterwards. But ladies and gentlemen, I hope you enjoyed the conversation. Go down to the show notes. Check it out. Check out the Twitch channel. Do yourself a huge favor, and if you're looking at cannabis as a brand or you know someone that is, check out what Will has to say. The guy's a leader in the in the community, in the space, and he's got some unique ideas that nobody else has. So thank you very much, everybody, for checking us out. That's all we got for today. Aloha.